Every 52 years, when the constellation we know as the Pleiades rose above Cerro de la Estrella, the ancient Aztecs celebrated the end and the beginning of a new measure of time, much like our own turn of the century, but for them, much more important. At Cerro de la Estrella, or Hill of the Star, they made a vital sacrifice. Without it, according to Aztec myths, the sun would die. The people of the sun was the way the Aztecs defined their race and religion. They waged a war for the universe. To them, this meant a fight to provide the sun with his sustenance. The nourishment needed was sacrifice, not of fruit or grain or goats, but of human life. They attacked their neighbors to get what the sun required. Captives were brought back to the temple and killed as offerings. Men needed the sun, and the sun needed its food. Here, there was no room for argument. Another great pyramid-building society, the Egyptians, also worshipped the sun. They called the sun Ra, and bestowed him with a personality and a place to live called Heliopolis, or Sun City. Today, we know the sun is not a person or a god. The sun is a star, an immense nuclear furnace, a space heater of our solar system. It's not surprising early peoples worship the sun, even though it's a very modest sized star. Compared to other stars, our sun is rather small, but it dominates our skies and our lives. When it rises above the horizon, the sun's brightness washes away the starlight. Only the moon sometimes remains, a ghost of its former self. The ancients were correct in one aspect of their belief. The sun is entirely central to life on Earth. Without it, the planet could have no living things on its surface. If the sun stopped shining right now, everything on Earth would freeze almost instantly. Even the air would crystallize and drift to the ground as oxygen and nitrogen snow. Everything would die, but would be preserved forever in a deep freeze. Moment by moment, the sun gives us free energy. At the equator, something like 800 watts of solar energy hits each square meter of ground. That's like having nearly 400 light bulbs of 1,000 watts each burning all day over a typical city house lot. That's some electric bill. But it's the sun that pays the price. To continue radiating at that rate, our star consumes almost four and a half million tons of itself each second. If we burned up this much matter on Earth, we'd lose the Rocky Mountains in about a month, and the rest of the continent would soon follow. Fortunately, the sun is so large that even at such a high rate of depletion, only one ten billionth of its total mass is used up each year. So the sun can burn as it does for many billions of years without running out of fuel. So we know the sun is huge, but the sheer size of it is just about impossible to comprehend. Anyone who has traveled around the world has some sense of how large our planet is, but the Earth would be little more than a bump on the surface of the sun. The sun is so immense, in fact, that it wouldn't even fit in the space between the Earth and the moon. You'd have to go to the moon and back five and a half times to equal a single trip around the sun's equator, almost three million miles. You know, we think of the sun as a given, a stable feature in our lives. People speak of a sure thing when they say something is as certain as the sunrise tomorrow. But is the sun perfectly constant? Where did it come from? And how was it formed? To answer these questions, we need to go back to an early age of the universe. Our universe began as an exploding point of pure energy. Only after 100,000 years when space had grown large enough and cool enough did matter begin forming from this pure energy. First, hydrogen appeared, the simplest of elements, and then helium, which is only a little more complicated. But 90% of all matter made was hydrogen. 
At first, scientists working on the Big Bang Theory had no idea why matter eventually started clumping together into galaxies and stars. They wondered why the universe hadn't just continued spreading smoothly outward forever. When they pointed their radio telescopes out into the deepest parts of the universe, they measured some strange microwave radiation that was exactly the same in every direction. The consistency of this radiation, which they knew came from the Big Bang, seemed to say that the Big Bang had sent space, matter, and energy flying apart at exactly the same rate. So once again, how could galaxies and stars have formed? Well, just recently, they made a breakthrough. A satellite called the Cosmic Background Explorer, designed specifically to measure that microwave afterglow of the Big Bang, detected an important discrepancy in their Earth-based observations. The radiation was not perfectly consistent. We've also been looking to see if this bright radiation is equally bright in every direction, and it's not. We just recently announced that it's slightly brighter in some directions than others by about a part in a hundred thousand that's not very much um, but what it means is we've seen gigantic structures that stretch across the whole sky these huge and ancient structures tell us that some parts of the infant universe glowed slightly hotter than others just one sixteen millionth of a degree still a tiny variation made a big difference causing more atoms to form in some areas of space and less in others. Where there was more matter, gravity was stronger. This gravity set matter in motion, and once started, there was no stopping it. Clouds of gas drew together, forming nurseries for galaxies and stars. These stars are called primary stars because they were made of the original matter created in the Big Bang. Most of the early stars were huge, hundreds of times bigger than our sun. They burned fast and died young, quickly using up their supply of hydrogen fuel. They aged quickly and exploded as supernovae. In the last stages of their lives, these first stars created more complex elements than the hydrogen and helium from which they were born. The nuclear fusion that powered the stars converted hydrogen to helium, helium to carbon, carbon to oxygen, oxygen to silicon, and finally silicon to iron. Now when their cores fused to become iron, the star was doomed. Fusing of iron takes more energy than a burning star can generate, so it collapses upon itself and explodes. The important thing about our sun is that our sun is not a first generation star. It's not formed out of the material that was created in the Big Bang itself. Instead, our sun has trace elements in it that result from stars that lived and died billions of years ago before our sun was formed. These stars burned up their nuclear fuel and exploded into space, casting their material off into clouds which condensed to form new stars. Our sun is one of those new stars. And because it is, that's why our solar system has the heavy elements in it. We'll return to the Practical Guide to the Universe on the Learning Channel.